than two million people could die should Pyongyang launch nuclear attacks on the capitals of South Korea and Japan. That's according to Michael J. Zagarek Jr., who shared his analysis of such a scenario through a report released via 38 North. His calculations were based on the assumption that the nuclear warheads would range from 15 to 250 kilotons in yield, used on the estimated population of 24.1 million for Seoul and 37.9 million for Tokyo. Zagreb also used three levels in the probability of detonation to predict the number of casualties, 20 percent, 50 and 80 percent. A death toll of 2.1 million and 7.7 million injuries were estimated in the event that North Korea fires its entire arsenal of 25 operational nuclear weapons against the two cities. The analysis was even more sobering given the fact that protection from the U.S. THAAD system was also taken into account, which could not prevent the devastating outcome. American attitudes toward North Korea have been greatly affected by what happened to Otto Warmbier. My wife is scared to have me here. We understand that Otto broke the law. He shouldn't have taken that poster, but he's dead. You're saying that we treated Otto Warmbier well because he didn't get bed sores. You're saying we spent a lot of money on him. Here's a healthy young man who visits the DPRK, commits a crime, and ends up in a coma, in a vegetative state, on your watch. How can Americans think of that and not feel some kind of deep resentment about the country that arrested him and imprisoned him, didn't let his family visit him, didn't let the Swedish ambassador have consular access to him. For decades, North Korea has been threatening to obliterate the United States. While these threats are delivered with theatrics, analysts are increasingly concerned about the very real threat of North Korea's growing arsenal. Kim Jong-un has dramatically ramped up missile development and testing since he came to power in 2011. Kim Jong-il tested 33 missiles during his 17-year reign. In just six years, his son has already tested more than twice as many. In particular, Kim Jong-un has pursued the development of ICBMs, intercontinental ballistic missiles, that could reach the U.S. According to analysts, North Korea plans to test two road mobile ICBMs, the KN-14 and the KN-08. In theory, KN-14 would be able to reach the west coast of the United States, and KN-08 would reach all the way to the east coast. Both of these missiles are designed to carry nuclear warheads. KN-08 and KN-14 are easy to transport, hard to detect, and can be launched from anywhere in the country. So I don't think we have any very good options for dealing with a North Korean ICBM at this point. We can't reliably shoot it down in flight. We can't reliably destroy it on the ground. So just how soon can we expect North Korea to develop an ICBM? Most nations have done it in about seven years. 
beginning their program had an ICBM at, at initial operational capability. For North Korea, I expect in 2020 or 2021. North Korea is going fast. Tests fail, tests succeed, and they're learning, and they, you can see them learning. North Korea lacks the economic and technological resources of other countries with ICBM programs. But Kim Jong-un has demonstrated a willingness to push missile development at any cost. Take, for example, North Korea's rapid development of Mushaden, an intermediate-range ballistic missile with a very similar engine to that of the KN-14 and KN-08. North Korea held its first test of Mushaden in April 2016, and they had their first successful fly in June. That took them just a few months, a very rapid pace. That is a bit unusual. Usually there's a longer time between tests at that sort of uh, stage of development. Let's fast forward to a hypothetical year 2021, and let's imagine North Korea has ICBM capabilities that could reach the U.S. What then? The U.S. has one primary missile defense system, ground-based mid-course defense. In theory, the system is capable of repelling an ICBM attack. Unfortunately, it only has a 50% success rate during peacetime testing. Um, if that missile defense system failed and if they did successfully attack uh, the U.S., then the policy that we have is to retaliate with nuclear weapons. In the face of this ever-escalating threat, it is clear that a different approach is required. The patience of the United States and our allies in this region has run out. We are sending an armada. And Kim Jong-un must surely know that if he were to launch an ICBM against the United States, the U.S. retaliation would be massive. The chances of North Korea developing and testing the missiles quite soon is high. But the at odds with each other. This is a cabinet secretary who speaks more with Donald Trump than any other member of the cabinet. And they talk all the time, and they're obviously very focused on North Korea. So is a good cop, bad cop? What's well, the strategy? I don't think it's necessarily that, just they're two people using their different strengths. And it is Rex Tillerson's job to work with his back channels to do what he can. And it's the president's job to use his unique uh, set of skills, which is mostly tweeting, to apply pressure. But they're both focused not just on North Korea, I think that's a limited way to look at it, but getting China to apply pressure to North Korea. And so but that, okay, but, but how does saying we have a back channel, we're talking, no, talking's dumb. How does that help with China? Well, one of the things is it's it may be true that they have these back channels, but they also might not be very good back channels. And so they are if, if the president is applying some pressure, letting North Korea know through China that they need to step up and actually provide some indication that they are taking these things seriously. Yeah. They each have their own way of doing it. One right. diplomatically, one through Twitter. Uh, speaking of diplomatically, is Rex Tillerson a good diplomat? Well, I think the results will have to speak for themselves, and so far it's been mixed. Do we have time for the results? Yeah, I mean, there's always time for results. I don't think that North Korea is going to nuke the United States tomorrow, right? And if we felt like that was a serious threat, we would probably wipe them out. I think this president certainly would be very serious about that. Uh, to me, this is a story of the Washington press obsessing over a potential rift and reading way into something that is a waste of time. I do think it's good cop, bad cop. Yeah. I think it is clumsy and ham-fisted, but that's what it is. And I want to see where we end up. There have, been, there have been steps made, real progress with China 
in the last couple of weeks. Absolutely. That, and, that, and, there's, and, and North Korea has also stood down from, yeah. you know, that hard threat to bomb Guam. Yeah. Well, I think if you look at all of the noise of the tweeting and the good cop, bad cop and the obsession over the media thinking that there's a rift, I think that in general, when you look at the, the high profile nature of these conversations with the Chinese, for example, they're not listening to the noise that we're listening to. They are very focused on the seriousness of what they have to do, what is expected, what they have to enforce, and what the results of that are going to be. We get a little snippet of what's actually going on, and I don't think that Rex Tillerson or even the president is really, quite frankly, worried about what it looks like on the surface. And in terms of Rex Tillerson saying there was a direct channel, they kind of walked that back a little bit and then tried to explain that it's a direct channel but not, not really, really a direct channel. Direct channel. There's I mean, it's not like a, a direct an intermediary channel. Intermediary of, of some kind talking yeah. to the North Koreans for us. So I think that we get distracted with the noise because that's what we can see. But behind the scenes, the Chinese are meeting with you know diplomats in the State Department, and they're talking about what they. Have. More than two million people could die should Pyongyang launch nuclear attacks on. the capitals of South Korea and Japan. That's according to Michael J. Zagarek Jr., who shared his analysis of such a scenario through a report released via 38 North. His calculations were based on the assumption that the nuclear warheads would range from 15 to 250 kilotons in yield, used on the estimated population of 24.1 million for Seoul and 37.9 million for Tokyo. Zagreb also used three levels in the probability of detonation to predict the number of casualties, 20 percent, 50 and 80 percent. A death toll of 2.1 million and 7.7 million injuries were estimated in the event that North Korea fires its entire arsenal of 25 operational nuclear weapons against the two cities. The analysis was even more sobering given the fact that protection from the U.S. THAAD system was also taken into account, which could not prevent the devastating outcome. American attitudes toward North Korea have been greatly affected by what happened to Otto Warmbier. My wife is scared to have me here. We understand that Otto broke the law. He shouldn't have taken that post.